half dozen spacecraft up that we're operating right now. There's a, um, uh, a constellation of five spacecraft called Themis, um, which was a magnetic, magnetic spheric um, science experiment. Um, three spacecraft in a sort of relatively low Earth orbit, and then two other spacecraft in highly elliptical orbits, um, and those were arranged so that they all aligned downwind um, from the Sun, Earth, three spacecraft, one spacecraft, one spacecraft, so you could make simultaneous in-situ measurements of the magnetic magnetosphere as the Sun's particles flowed past the Earth. Um, once the science for that mission was done, we took those outer two spacecraft and uh, we redubbed them the Artemis mission. There's the, uh, the FAST mission, which is a, a rural snapshot mission that was in a polar orbit. And uh, that was taking pictures of the aurora to see how the auroras form and, and die and, and mutate and things. Um, specifically, uh, this, this, that sort of fields and particle stuff has to do with um, basically solar weather and interaction of the sun's activity and, um, and what happens with the Earth, um, our, our global magnetosphere, but also stuff down in our ionosphere that affects things like radio communications, you know, signal propagation, uh, power grid interference from solar storms, things like that. So, uh, oh, and then um, we recently launched our first CubeSat, which is this cinema. A lovely thing that started in about the last 10 years. Um, most rockets are designed to launch a fixed amount of mass. And then um, a lot of spacecraft come in slightly under mass. And so you have to put a ballast weight on these rockets because um, the rockets are optimized to loft a specific amount of mass. Um, well, a guy named Bob Twiggs at Stanford came up with the idea of, of having a standardized carrier that um, could, at the last minute, hold some little tiny spacecraft um, CubeSats that are about well, 10 centimeters on a side and weigh a, a kilogram or two. And the idea was that these would be contained inside a launcher, um, so, which would be very robust, so you wouldn't have to worry about that damaging the primary mission. Um, but you could have student designed and built experiments that you could shove into this thing at the last minute, and the rocket would deploy the, the main spacecraft, and then these things would get shot out. Um, so it took a little while, but the CubeSat stuff is really starting, if you'll forgive the pun, to take off, um, uh, because they're so quick and cheap and um, uh, if, if it doesn't work or if it falls apart, there's really no impact on the rocket or the primary science mission. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a mission operations center. Um, during the Apollo days, it used to be really cool. You had all these custom designed consoles and stuff, and you had pneumatic tubes so you could send messages and donuts and apples to your buddies and stuff like that. Well, these days, we're in the computer software age, and so, um, you know, it's just, it looks like computers pretty much in these mission operation centers. So we're controlling spacecraft and we're sweating bullets just like in the old days, but um, it's, not, it's not quite as cool looking as, um, as in the Apollo stuff. Um, but radio antennas haven't changed that much. So here's a picture of our 10 meter dish, um, 30 feet in diameter. Uh, we can talk out to our uh, Art Artemis spacecraft out around the moon uh, with this puppy. You can see there's a, um, That's a human-sized access door to get in there. So it's a, it's a pretty decent size, not as big as the Deep Space Network telescopes that the NASA runs, you know, that are, um, you know, 100 meters or whatever, or the uh, NRAO stuff, but pretty decent sized antenna. That's just down the hill from Space Sciences Lab, so it's a couple hundred yards, uh, and we've got fiber optic links that run up into the, the Mission Control Center. Those uh, harnesses go up the hill into this um, equipment rack uh, back here that actually controls the antenna slewing and has all the RF systems for uh, receiving telemetry and transmitting data and stuff like that. Um, for New Star, I pulled some shifts um, in the mock uh, controlling the spacecraft and, and doing stuff. So why should we be spending money on X-ray stuff? Why do we care about X-ray stuff? X-rays are really cool because uh, it's really dealing with high energy astrophysics. And we're really talking about primarily black hole and supernova stuff, stars exploding, um, stars um, compressing down to a point where they're not really in the physical universe anymore, um, and the processes that go around these things. Um, X-rays are also cool because um, they can come uh, from deep in the center of things, like uh, the center of our, our um, galaxy It has a black hole in it. 
and there's some interesting things going on. I'll show a little picture later of a uh, uh, of New Star catching um, some matter being eaten by that black hole on the center of the Milky Way. So the science objectives for New Star. Um, one of the things that's interesting is we want to do a better job of figuring out where all the black holes are in, in the universe. Um, is, are they uniformly distributed? Um, do they just get um, created in certain areas? Um, do they disappear out of certain areas? So there's a lot of uncertainty about where these things are and, and what they're doing. Um, and also exactly how they um, uh, evolve individually. And uh, this slide has got a little thing in there. Um, you know, all the, all the heavy elements, essentially anything other than hydrogen and helium uh, were created in, in uh, supernova and, uh, and then coalesced into the solar systems and then formed into planets and then formed into us. And so that's our attempt to get um, uh, other folks interested in, in science and seeing that this is part of the evolution of the universe that leads to, um, to life. And then um, we're also interested in uh, what's happening with some of the, the most extreme um, uh, galaxies, uh, things, uh, it's called AGNs now, active galactic nu nuclei, but, um, you know, quasars is a term that's been around for a while for these, for these sorts of objects that are um, uh, enormous objects pumping out tremendous amounts of energy and we really want to understand uh, just exactly what's going on in there. Um, New Star is cool because um, it's not only an imaging telescope, but it also does spectroscopy. So it can take essentially x-ray color photographs um, of uh, some of these phenomena. And this slide is, is a comparison of uh, an image of a certain portion of the sky as it might have been taken by the integral um, mission that's on orbit. And then there's a comparison of um, New Star's resolution. So it's, it's about 100 times clearer. And as you folks know, you know, when you get, when things get clearer, when the atmosphere is bad, you know, um, things look crummy, and then when the atmosphere settles down and things get clearer, you can often see more features and do more science. So uh, it just seems natural that with um, a higher resolution telescope um, that does imaging as well as spectroscopy, that we're going to be able to do more interesting science. And there have been a number of papers. Um, Alex mentioned one, the, uh, the frame dragging um, thing around black holes. Fascinating result. Um, there have been a co another couple of um, very interesting results. And New Star is just celebrating its uh, first birthday on orbit next week. So hopefully there will be lots of good stuff um, to come from New Star. One of the problems with doing uh, high resolution um, optics at any wavelength is, is getting um, a focal length, right? You know, you know, bigger telescopes, longer telescopes, typically you can do more fun stuff with them. Um, the, the issue with that is to get stuff into orbit, uh, that makes it extremely difficult. And for New Star, where we needed um, uh, about a 10 meter focal length, about 30 feet, um, there really aren't any launch vehicles where you can have um, uh, mirrors at, at one end and then 30 feet away have an optics bench at the other end and expect to get that thing into orbit. Um, so, and uh, New Star is also a relatively inexpensive mission. It's an Explorer class mission, so it's capped at. You'll laugh when I say when I say this number after I said inexpensive, but um, it's a couple hundred million dollar mission, which is cheap for space flight. You know, shuttle flights half a billion dollars just for the flight, or a billion dollars depending on whose uh, accounting you believe. So, a couple hundred million dollars for a science mission, space based mission, is really pretty cheap. Um, and, and excellent value for your tax money. So, so keep sending in your taxes. The question is where the funds come, um, how do you propose for a mission like this? And what NASA does is they, there is a formal proposal process, and they'll come along and they plan, um, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a group of scientists and engineers, um, the, uh, part of the National Research Council, that um, comes up with a decadal plan of science that they want to see happen. And so that, they list all the science missions that they think would be terribly exciting. And then the NASA folks usually look at that list and they say, oh yeah, look, that's pretty cool. Um, we, could, we could afford to do two missions this year, start two missions this year. We could, and then we'd have to skip a year, but then maybe we could start one mission and then we'd have to skip another couple of years. 
So they kind of come up with a budget cycle based on how much money they think they can have and the resources that they think are available. And they'll then um, try and prioritize the science that's cool. And then they'll put out um, uh, requests for proposals. And science teams will then, um, uh, they'll then write up a, you know, a 50 or 100 page, page proposal on why NASA should spend $200 million. You know, they're, they're usually these capsules. These are SMEX missions, small explorer missions. So that's usually 200 or $250 million is the budget. Um, we'll talk about that Solar Pro Plus mission. That's about a billion dollar mission. And so, you know, the opportunities for those come through much less frequently. But, so NASA then goes through this process. People send in proposals. There are independent reviews to try and pick which proposals look like they're the most exciting and the most realistic in terms of actually being able to complete. And then those proposals will get um, awarded to the, to the universities typically, um, or sometimes some ind independent research organizations will get awarded um, uh, money to do uh, an initial phase study, and then if it looks like they're going to get the job done, they'll get more money to continue on. So, did, did that kind of answer the question? It's kind of, you know, it's a lot of money, and it, it's a long time frame, and so there's a lot of review. People try and make sure that it's not only relevant and exciting science, but also that it's going to be doable, and you aren't going to fly something that, you know, is just not going to work for engineering or scientific reasons. Um, so we just got, um, we, we applied two years ago for a SMEX announcement um, for this ICON mission and we just found out about three weeks ago that we were getting funded. And so we're going to get a small batch of money for the next year to do our next phase A studies to try and convince the NASA folks that we really and truly do have a plan and we understand what we're doing to get the funding to then build the mission and launch it. We were talking about how difficult it is to get things on the orbit um, inexpensively, and in the case of New Star, it meant that we had to try and fold everything up together. There are two mirrors out here, um, and these are uh, uh, X-rays are really are really kind of tough. You know, if you do normal incident stuff like on our telescopes, the X-rays will either go through or they'll stick in the optics, and so you have to do what's called grazing incidence optics, which is really like taking a stone and skipping it off the water, so you have to come in at a very low incidence angle, so when the stone hits the water, it bounces back off again. And so that's what these mirrors are, is they're grazing incidence mirrors. So um, there's actually about 130 layers nested um, together. So imagine, um, imagine cylinders, each one slightly smaller than the next one, and there are 133 of those, I think. Each one of those is made up of a half a dozen pieces of glass. So there are a couple thousand pieces of glass in each one of these puppies held together by epoxy and, and uh, graphite um, spacers. The, um, the mirrors, the individual mirrors were made up at Goddard Space Flight Center um, by taking extremely thin pieces of glass and you slump them at high temperature over a quartz um, mandrel that's been highly uh, machined to high tolerances. And then we sent these things over to the Dutch who um, put the optical coating on them and then the individual mirrors came back um, to a facility that Columbia University runs um, up in New York called the Nevis Labs. And um, that's where they, they glued all these things together over the course of six months and then put them in an x-ray testing facility. They've got a vacuum facility with a couple hundred foot long tunnel and a frighteningly large x-ray source at one end. Um, and then with lots of interlocks so you weren't in the room when they turned that thing on. You'll glow for a long time if they do. And then they've got a, a, a big set of motors where they can move that thing around and a detector at the back end. So you move this thing around to characterize the surface and make sure it's okay. So they built two of those. Um, and there was a couple page Scientific American article about this. And there's also um, a really excellent Wikipedia summary on the New Star mission about, um, about this mirror stuff. So go to the Wikipedia article. It looked pretty good to me. Um, and then in order to fit inside the rocket, the, um, the optics bench up here had to be right next to the focal plane bench where, in the spacecraft where the detectors are. Um, and in order to get that 10 meter distance, we have this um, motorized mass that um, folds up inside a trash can sized container and then over the course of 25 incredibly frightening minutes 
Um, there's an electric motor that spins this, this thing out, um, and it's got to expand and lock into place a couple thousand Tinker Toy pieces, um, good to a couple millimeters. There's a, a motor adjustment mechanism on the end, um, but this thing actually worked. It was, and I've got a little video that shows it spooling out later um, of computer animation. Um, but that was really the key, key thing by, built by um, ATK Corporation in, in Goleta, California that allowed us to, to fly the New Star mission on this uh, $15 million um, Pegasus launcher. And then at the back, the back end is the, uh, the focal plane of the detectors of the science instrument. And then there was a spacecraft, there is a spacecraft built by Orbital Sciences Corporation. Um, here in Dulles, Virginia. Anybody work for Orbital Sciences? Or? Okay, too bad, because we've got a really good team, um, and they put together a really nice spacecraft. It's been working really well for us. And then there's a big um, a solar array panel, and you can see it wrapped around the spacecraft down here. So it's jointed, and it's all um, it's got uh, holding mechanisms to hold it during the, the launch so it doesn't vibrate, vibrate loose and get destroyed. So you get this thing on orbit, and the first thing that has to happen is that solar array has to unfold so that you can get power. Because otherwise you're dead after about an hour, the batteries will run out. And then um, we spent a couple weeks um, making sure that the spacecraft was all happy and, and that everything was working, and it all looked really good, as a matter of fact. Um, and then, um, as I said, there was a half an hour of terror when, um, when we turned this loose and got the mass to deploy. And it all worked just perfectly. I was having nightmares about it, but um, you know, in fact, I, I was completely and utterly wrong. I freely admit that, and it all worked just uh, just really well. The X-ray detectors are these uh, very interesting things called CZT, cad cadmium zinc telluride crystals, and um, the photons uh, hit the front of those things and they deposit a charge particle. And then you have, um, sticking into the back of these crystals, a bunch of electrodes um, that get read out. Kind of eh, not dissimilar to a CCD detector that you might use for imaging stuff. You know, CCDs, you end up with charge and charge buckets, and then you usually um, uh, clock those out of the detector. These CCT things will actually generate, depending on where the photons hit on the crystal, um, they'll generate an electric field on the back end, and you have these electrodes that you try and and analyze the xy position, but also the, um, the energy, uh, the, the, the color of the x-ray is a function of the signal that you get out of the back of these things. So um, you actually focus an image on these things and it tells you what the color was. Um, evidently revolutionary. Um, previous missions typically used an x-ray mask where there was a, uh, you can call it a black and white detector. It, 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 there was either a photon there or not, and you didn't know what the energy of the photon was, but you knew the energy because you would put um, a pattern of various opacity masks in front of the detector, and so you would only get um, uh, lower energy photons, x-rays could only come through this section because it was thin, and you, you'd only get high, you could get, you, sorry, you could get a lot of, of photons through the thin areas, you wouldn't get very many photons through the thick areas, and there was some mathematical magic that you could then perform that would um, that would let you take that and do a coarse um, color picture on the sky. But that's why you know you were getting these pictures like the integral one, where you've got these huge fat pixels because it was a masking artifact. You couldn't get very precise pictures. With New Star, you're actually cutting out all that masking stuff. You actually have mirrors which are focusing the x-rays onto an imaging detector and then through some magic of, of electric, electronics you get um, the energy of the photon at the same time as its x-y position. Um, so there are, there are these two um, sets of optics. There are two sets of detectors. Um, there are four CZT crystals on each detector and they're, they're organized in quadrants with a little tiny gap in the middle that the science team is frantic not to have um, be in the critical point on the sky. So we spend a lot of time you know, moving things just a tiny bit so it's in the sweet spot on the detector. You essentially have to have a, a, a very slightly curved mirror with, um, with a very narrow um, collecting area. Um, the first space telescope I, work, I worked on was a thing called uh, EUVE, the Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer. 
And uh, EUV, EUV photons um, also have the same characteristic <coughs> that they tend to stick uh, to optics. And so um, what we had was grazing instance mirrors, but we had a single grazing instance mirror. So we had three telescopes literally the size of trash cans, uh, but their collecting area was about a half an inch um, torus around the edge of that because that was the, the area in which the photons could come in and still hit the mirror and graze off to get down to the detector. The Pegasus XL is really cool because it's, um, uh, I showed three stages here. It's actually a four-stage rocket. The first stage is a reusable um, L-1011 jetliner. And we'll talk about the, the characteristics of that a little bit later. It's totally unlike any launch vehicle that I've ever worked, worked on before. Um, it's also entirely solid. So there's a, um, there's a big solid motor here with a wing. Um, this thing actually flies on the wing, so it gets dropped off the L-1011, the first stage lights, and it flies um, until that first stage burns out. And then um, there's a, a second stage, um, a fairing to protect the science payload from atmospheric forces and during the ferry flight. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then there's a third stage that actually gets it into, um, into the final orbit. And those are all solids. Um, which is cool because it means you don't have to worry about cryogenic liquids while you're getting ready to launch. Um, the bad news is that you're sitting next to 40,000 pounds of low explosives while you're playing with your spacecraft and you have it powered on. Um, so that tends to bring a focus to testing activities. <laughs> sometimes absent from other activities. Um, I told you I was giving this talk to the rocket crowd earlier. So, um, so these are some, some nitty-gritty numbers about, uh, about rocket stuff. Um, the coolest thing, well, ATK built, built this thing. Uh, it's got about, uh, the Pegasus weighs about 55,000 pounds, um, and that's fully fueled because it comes fueled when it's assembled. Um, and about 40,000 odd pounds of that are uh, um, this uh, solid propellant that's basically the same stuff that's used in the solid rocket motors of the shuttle. Very close to that same propellant mix. If you fly those little Estes um, black powder motors, the D motors that are about this long and, and about an inch in diameter, um, those are typically D size and um, they have about 10 newtons uh, worth, of, um, worth of energy. Um, each one of the letter grades in motor goes up by a factor of two. So you go from a D to an E and you double the amount of, of power essentially in the motor. And so this first stage is a baby Z, which um, has, has everybody in the rocketry room giggling like little children, imagining what sort of projects they could do with that. Um, and it's, uh, it's 10 meters long and it's uh, about a meter and a quarter in diameter. So we're talking about a lot of hardware. I urge you to go to the Ibar Hazi and stand next to this thing, and uh, um, it's pretty impressive. Most of the interior of the L-1011 has been ripped out, um, and there are just a few seats left for the ground crew that flies with the aircraft. They take mechanics, um, some of the rocket crew that maintain the Pegasus, and then there are uh, launch consoles and things in the front end of the aircraft to control the Pegasus and um, the uh, science payload. Uh, while the aircraft is being flown from the integration facility um, to the launch facility and when it's being flown during the actual launch mission itself. So what happens during the launch? Um, the Pegasus goes up to about 40,000 feet. Um, depends a lot on the mission, but this is sort of a general profile. And if you go to orbital.com, which is the Orbital Sciences Corporation website, they have a launch systems group, and you can go down there, and they've got some brochures on the Pegasus and, and about the L-1011, and they've also got the payload user's guide for the Pegasus. So that's actually the engineering handbook that you go to if you want to know how much you can cram into a Pegasus and what sort of performance you can get out of it. That's free on their website. You can just get that and look at it if you're curious. Um, so the L-1011 goes up about 40,000 feet, um, and it drops the Pegasus. Um, what's the first thing the L-1011 does after they drop the Pegasus? Run. Sure. They run. Yeah, exactly. They try and get out of there. And these are some gutsy people. The, um, the lead pilot, Bob, um, Bill Weaver, was the chief test pilot for the L-1011 series. And he's the only guy who's ever survived an in-flight Mach 3 breakup of an SR-71. So these are not people who are, who are afraid of much. 
um, but they get out of the way as soon as that puppy drops. Because about five seconds later, um, that first stage motor lights, and then this thing is flying itself. It's under internal guidance. Uh, there is a range safety package, so it can be destroyed um, if it starts to deviate from its flight path too much. Um, you hope that doesn't happen, and you buy donuts for the range safety crew to sweeten them up before the mission so they won't be too fast on that button. Um, but after about a minute, that first stage burns off and, uh, and uh, falls typically in the ocean. Usually you don't see that again. Um, the wing is a composite structure. Sometimes it breaks off, and, um, and they've had a couple of those um, wash up on beaches. The New Star, um, the entire first stage, actually caused quite a ruckus because the thing in, it, in its entirety washed up on a beach in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And um, people thought that there were munitions there and um, the orbital folks had to scramble a crew. It was a, uh, I got a copy of the email from the, from the assault team up, that went on the beach to deal with this thing and fishing boats and electrical systems going out and running out of fuel at night and having to get onto the beach of this uninhabited island so that they could inspect something that, that they were 99.9% .9 sure was entirely safe. So it was an adventure. It doesn't always happen, but New Star was it. We flew at night because we were very concerned about heat build up, build up inside the, um, the shroud that protects the, the spacecraft during launch. We have to have the spacecraft with at least a minimal amount of power um, but you remember I, I told you that those mirrors have uh, 130 layers held together by epoxy? Turns out, well, we knew um, that that epoxy is heat sensitive. And it get, if it gets up above about 50 degrees C, it starts to slump. And as optics people, what happens when your mirror starts to slump? Exactly, that's a bad day. Um, so we were really paranoid about, um, about making sure that inside the shroud got kept, kept cool. We didn't do any operations during the day. We, um, you know, we had sunshades up, things like that, to try and keep things cool. But no, there wasn't anything special that happened to the booster um, on launch day. This whole flight profile takes about 15 minutes to get to orbit, um, and then uh, the spacecraft separates and it starts doing its thing. It's got separation detectors, and it will autonomously try and deploy solar rays, get them pointed at the sun, so it can start charging up those batteries, um, and uh, it starts trying to orient itself. Um, Orbital's got a, a nice handout that shows their, uh, they have a whole bunch of different launch vehicles and, and military rockets that they use and stuff like that. And I want to show this, um, on the extreme left is a, uh, is a Pegasus XL, which is a thing that was used for, um, uh, for New Star. And on the extreme right there's a thing called, the, uh, or, I'm sorry, the, um, the Taurus XL. And what the Taurus XL is, is um, this is basically a Pegasus with a bigger shroud on it. And then this extra motor has to get stuck on there. That's what you don't have to deal with if you have that L-1011 getting you up to 40,000 feet and 600 miles an hour or whatever, um, whatever it is on, on launch day. So you can see you actually end up saving quite a bit of rocket hardware um, by getting up to, to altitude. The, uh, the Taurus is a ground launch thing. So you know it sits on the ground vertically, launches vertically, um, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if Orville is actually. So um, after about 15 minutes, you get into, um, uh, in our case, we wanted a what's called an equatorial orbit. We wanted something that didn't oscillate very far north or south of the equator. And that's primarily because the Earth's magnetic field is not um, uh, exactly centered on the Earth's rotational axis. There's actually an offset. And over the South Atlantic, um, is where the Earth's magnetic field is actually closer to the surface of the Earth. And so um, if you're at these sorts of altitudes, four or five hundred kilometers, you know, space station orbit altitude, um, lots of low Earth orbit set, uh, altitude, you're actually flying through the bottom edge of the, of the magnetic uh, field in the South Atlantic anomaly, and those are charged particles that have been spat out from the sun, and they've been caught in the Earth's magnetic field, and you basically build up not only radiation exposure on your components, which will tend to degrade your electronic components, but also these high energy particles tend to look like source. So they're kind of like um, uh, light pollution 
for these orbiting telescopes. So when you go through the South Atlantic anomaly, it'll typically shut down your detectors. If it doesn't shut down your detectors, it adds um, noise to your measurements. So the, uh, uh, the principal investigator was willing to argue that um, she wanted the, the spacecraft launched into as low an inclination as or orbit as possible. Um, if you fly into a space station orbit where you're, you're coming up 57 degrees and going down 57 degrees, you spend a lot of time going through the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, in this orbit, we only graze it when we come through here, and so we lose a minimal amount of science time, and we have um, uh, the smallest possible radiation exposure, additional radiation exposure. So I mentioned that the spacecraft was built at um, the Orbital Sciences Facility up here at Dulles. The, um, the telescope was mostly built um, at Caltech, uh, uh, which is in Pasadena, California. Caltech, California Institute of Technology, runs the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. You've probably heard of that for the, for the Mars missions. Um, and the principal investigator, Dr. Fiona Harrison, is a professor at, um, at Caltech. So what happened is, um, uh, they built the detectors and stuff. Um, ATK built the mast in Goleta, California, which is near Santa Barbara. Um, all that stuff shipped out here and got bolted onto the spacecraft at Orbital Sciences. Uh, we, we did a lot of testing to make sure it was all going to work together. And then we shipped the spacecraft to Vandenberg Air Force Base in Southern California, um, just inland from uh, Santa Barbara, where Orbital Sciences typically integrates their Pegasus launch vehicles. And they have this building called 1553, which is out in the hinterlands of Vandenberg. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a reinforced building because you're working with explosives. Um, and so if, uh, if you have a bad day, they don't want that stuff getting loose on the rest of the base. So we've got a building that's oriented um, in the proper direction that if the Pegasus tries to take off, it's going to um, go off into the scrub brush. And we spend lots of time training on not bringing our cell phones in, you know, uh, not having any radiation sources, cell phones, Wi-Fi, um, avoiding uh, static electricity, um, having glass doors that you um, open, go through, and you close so that if you have a bad day, um, other people have a chance to, to get out. Um, and inside, on um, 1553, here's a picture of me in front of the, um, uh, the Pegasus. It's almost uh, fully integrated at this point. There's a clean room up here that you can't see. The front part of the Pegasus um, sticks into that clean room, and we have the observatory in there. Um, you really try and minimize the exposure to um, things like organic uh, molecules, grease on fingers, because that stuff tends to absorb um, these high energy. You know, it's bad for optical stuff, right? It's bad enough when you get it on your eyepieces or whatever. Um, it's even worse with these grazing incidence mirrors where uh, a single fingerprint, you know, you may have to travel a long distance through that. So you really try and avoid any sort of, of uh, contamination sources on the inside or the outside of the spacecraft because when you get into space and stuff heats up, um, your optics are going to be cold because they're pointing at deep space. Solar rays are going to be hot because they're pointing at the sun. Any sort of grease on the, on the solar rays is going to heat up, volatilize, and then it's going to condense. Sorry, it's going to condense on the nearest cold thing, which is your optics, um, like dew. Um, so, very bad thing. We try and avoid that. So, that's the clean room up in the front. Um, and I've, uh, so I spent a lot of time in there running. Um, there's a little computer in here, which is a mini copy of the Mission Operations Center. And that was my job to, uh, to program and run that computer. And that's what I used to turn the spacecraft on, the observatory on, and test it and configure it and get it ready for launch. Um, and then there were other consoles that were used to actually control the, um, uh, the Pegasus um, rocket itself. So this is what things normally look like. Um, this is what things look like when, when a squirrel attempts to take a shortcut through the transformer that supplies electric power to one quarter of the base. Um, that was extremely exciting because we were in the middle of doing an observatory test. This was a, a video that they were showing on launch day. So here's a picture of the L-1011 sitting on the hot pad on Kwajalein, uh, which is an island in the South Pacific, which is where we sorted out of to fly New Star. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, George is, is trying to fill the time until launch and keep people from falling asleep. Um, and so one of the things he did was uh, 
will show a video about the um, integration process that happened at Vandenberg. This is actually a little bit into the process because the uh, solid rocket motor shows up from ATK and it's just the motor. So I don't know if you noticed there that, um, uh, that the wing had already been installed. So um, that's one of the first things that goes on. Um, but you notice that there aren't any fins there. Uh, the back end of the, um, of the Pegasus, the nozzle doesn't steer the way the nozzles do on the, the solid rocket boosters on the shuttle. It's a fixed nozzle, so that means it's cheap and reliable. Um, and there are three fins back there that have motors on them. So um, uh, uh, those uh, fins actually um, steer the Pegasus during its initial um, uh, launch. Uh, once that first stage dumps off and the shroud opens up, um, there's a, a cold gas system that's used for, um, for adjusting the rocket. Um, uh, that tank in the middle is part of the, uh, the cold gas system that um, uh, uh, it's uh, basically jet nozzles uh, pressurized with nitrogen that control the pointing of the, of the upper stages of the Pegasus while it tries to fly into orbit. And you're looking um, from the aft end of the Pegasus towards, well now we're, yeah, we're at the aft end of the Pegasus, we're kind of looking forward. Um, those are fins, so they're going to get bolted onto the, uh, you can see that square hole where the motor goes and the fins go in there. So you can see this is actually a, a pretty large rocket. You know, as I mentioned, the, um, that first stage booster is about a meter and a quarter in diameter, you know, maybe about five feet. Um, it's a lot of mass. Um, there are some moving parts here, so you need to keep uh, hands and arms out of the way, um, especially during testing. Uh, when you try and fool that booster into thinking that it's flying and you want to see what the what those fins do, those will take your arm off if um, if you aren't paying attention. So um, uh, we try and pay a lot of attention. I don't think there have been any injuries at the at the orbital facility. So mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's a good thing. Um, the ICON mission I mentioned I'm going to be working on that's probably also going to be a Pegasus launch, but at the Kennedy Space Center. So it'll be interesting to work with the orbital crew again. Um, so things get assembled in building 1553, and then they get put on this transport trailer, and um, you get a police escort across base um, to the um, to the hot pad. And hot pads are typically a portion of an airfield where you store aircraft that have live arm armaments on them. And they're a facility where um, uh, in wartime, if they get bombed, it'll, it'll reduce the amount of damage you know, to other aircraft and the facilities. But in a case like this, they're in a place where if you screw up and you try and launch the Pegasus while it's attached to the bottom of the L-1011, you hopefully won't you know, end up going through the bowling alley or something like that. Um, you'll end up going down the runway and off into the, off into the Pacific. <coughs> and here's the shroud going onto um, uh, uh, the uh, Pegasus. That, um, that round thing that we saw just a second ago was the, under there was the, um, the top of the mirrors. So you can see one of the, one of the mirrors just in here. So that shroud is responsible for protecting the payload when you fly from Vandenberg Air Force Base to um, whatever launch site, Kennedy, or um, uh, in our case, Kwajalein in the South Pacific. And you typically do these operations early in the morning so you can have as few people on the road as possible. Vandenberg's a, um, uh, a very busy base. It's typically the base where people coming back from overseas deployments come to uh, for debriefing and, and getting reintroduced. Um, so there's a lot of traffic during the day, so we do this stuff um, uh, early to try and have as few people in the way um, in case of an incident as possible. And you jack the L-1011 up um, uh, and uh, get it up as high as possible, and then you put the uh, Pegasus underneath there. And notice they, they had removed the vertical fin. The vertical fin won't clear the L-1011. Um, uh, you can't jack it up high enough to get that that thing under there with the vertical fin installed. So you have to put the fin on um, after you get under the L-1011, there's a well that sticks up into the bottom, into the cargo compartment of the L-1011, and that's where that, uh, that vertical fin goes. And then um, uh, there are a bunch of attachment points, and if you haven't um, messed up, the, um, the Pegasus is now attached to the bottom of the L-1011. 
and you're ready to start doing um, integration tests to make sure that you can still talk to Texas and your observatory while they're mounted on the bottom of the aircraft. Um, and that's uh, the L-1011 flying off to uh, Hawaii for, um, on its way to Kwajalein. So the thing that I was responsible for, I was, the, um, I was on the Berkeley Mission Operations Team for, um, and I was the on-site representative for the New Star mission. So it was my responsibility to run that copy of the Mission Operations Center and, uh, and uh, test the observatory and configure it before launch. A lot of stuff like uh, loading last minute orbital elements, making sure that the various things were enabled and various things were safe, just get it ready to fly. So um, uh, Vandenberg isn't like a commercial airport. There aren't jetways or anything like that. There's, there's one stairwell that's tall enough to get into an L-1011 and you can't carry a 400 pound um, you know, equipment rack up that, so you have to lift your stuff up um, 20 odd feet on this monster forklift and hope that it doesn't tip over and, um, and cause a launch delay. It's really cold at Vandenberg, especially at 4 o'clock in the morning when you're trying to run these tests. It'll be 40 degrees, 50 degrees if you're lucky. There's no heating in the L-1011 because you only get that if you run the, the APU, the auxiliary power unit, a little jet motor that, that will provide um, electricity and heating and air conditioning. So what you do instead is you layer absolutely every piece of clothing that you have in your suitcase on you to try and avoid freezing to death while you're doing this. And that's us shivering um, at about 3 o'clock in the morning trying to get that, that wretched test done. So um, forward of this curtain is what used to be first class. There are some first class seats up there which are the seats used by the mechanics and things who fly with the aircraft. And then you might be able to see some equipment racks up there which are used in flight to monitor the Pegasus, to launch the Pegasus, and to control and observe the spacecraft. And then our stuff um, just packs up in the shipping crates. Um, you notice our, uh, our plastic lawn furniture, um, <laughs> high tech, uh, probably cost $10,000 on, on a military contract. Um, <laughs> we got it from Walmart. Um, all that stuff gets bundled up and uh, stowed in the aft end of the aircraft to try and balance out the weight of this 50 or 60,000 pounds worth of Pegasus under the belly of the L-1011. Um, so I mentioned we wanted low inclination orbit um, for this mission. Uh, when you launch out of Kennedy, the, 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 minimum, um, the minimum amount of energy that you spend to get into orbit will get you into an orbit um, whose inclination is equivalent to your latitude. So if you launch due east, um, what happens is you're flying in a, in a great circle around the Earth, and so you'll fly from Kennedy at 28 degrees, um, you'll fly south over the equator, you'll get as far south as 28 degrees south, you'll come back up again, meanwhile the Earth is rotated underneath you. So you're basically crisscrossing back and forth from Kennedy for the minimum amount of energy to get into orbit, plus and minus 28 degrees. If you have a very capable launch vehicle, you can adjust that. So if you're willing to spend more energy to get into orbit, you can adjust that inclination. To get into a space station orbit, you can fly north and get into a higher orbit, but you have to compensate by putting in more energy. Okay, um, New Star, cheap mission, the biggest possible spacecraft in the smallest possible rocket. We have no energy left to play any games with changing the inclination of our orbit. Which is why um, Pegasus, an air launch vehicle, becomes so cool. It means you can, in theory, fly anywhere in the Earth and launch from any latitude into um, any orbit you, you want to. And so, um, since we had maxed out the capabilities of the Pegasus, it meant that to get the, the smallest inclination orbit with the least exposure to the South Atlantic anomaly, we had to get as close to the equator as we possibly could. And realistically, the closest place to do that is um, in the middle of the South Pacific, um, in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, in this island called um, Kwajalein, which is leased by the U.S. military um, from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. It's, it's entirely a, a U.S. military base, uh, primarily used to test um, a ballistic missile, strategic weapons systems, and anti-ballistic missile systems. So it's, uh, it's got a stack of radars and optical telescopes and things on board that are used when they shoot missiles from Vandenberg at them. <laughs> um, they usually try and miss, so it's not that scary. They only occasionally try and actually get in the lagoon. 
Um, and they don't let civilians on there when they do that stuff. So um, I wasn't privileged to be on the receiving end of a dummy, you hope, warhead um, from a Minuteman. Um, but they also do ABM stuff, and then they also do a bunch of satellite detection stuff. Uh, amateur radio operators, um, the new space fence is going to get built on Kwajalein, um, if you're interested in that stuff. So that's a, a radio fence, basically, where you shoot radio signals up into outer space, and then you have remote detectors. It's kind of like a radar unit. And uh, as objects come through that radio wave fence, they'll uh, reflect the energy and you'll cure pings at these different radio receivers and you can, um, you can detect uh, debris and space and, and satellites and stuff like that. So uh, where is Kwajalein? Well, it's not close to any place, I can tell you. Um, there's commercial service twice a week. Um, you can start in Hawaii, there's, a, there's an airplane that starts in Hawaii, an island pops down and, stop, and ends up at Guam on one day, and then the next day it turns around and an island pops back again. Uh, the only other way to get there uh, or away from there is if you get sick and you're willing to spend um, about uh, $20,000 an hour to get a C-17 cargo aircraft scrambled out of Hickam in Hawaii. So they do do medevac stuff. So you don't want to get sick on Kwajalein. Um, because we were starting the launch campaign, um, uh, we, want, we, had to, we had people on, on board um, who needed to get to Kwajalein to save the the Pegasus and the observatory as soon as possible after it landed. But we didn't have room on board the L-1011 for those people. I begged and pleaded and cried. I threw myself on the ground wanting to be on the L-1011 during the ferry flight. It did not work. Um, but because the commercial flights are so restricted, what we did is we um, uh, chartered a, a 737. Uh, there's a company called Miami Air that flies sports teams around and stuff like that. And you, charter these aircraft and they'll, they'll basically take you wherever you want. So we, um, uh, we chartered Miami Air and they came and they landed on Vandenberg um, and we got on board on Vandenberg and took off and then a couple hours later the L-1011 uh, took off with Texas and we, all, and we met up in, uh, in Hawaii and spent the night in Hawaii. Um, I was frantic with rage. Um, we mentioned, somebody mentioned the transit of Venus earlier. Um, this was transit of Venus day. Yeah, I was upset. Um, but fortunately, we landed in Hawaii, and the transit was only about halfway done, and I bought a huge stack of those Eclipse classes, and so I handed them out to the flight crew and everything, and here we are in the ramp um, at uh, Hawaii International, and uh, we're all getting sun blindness looking at, uh, at the Eclipse of Venus. So that actually, actually worked out pretty well. And then I just got picked up by the other charter flight that was carrying the federal prisoners from the island back to the states for medical care. So we didn't get mixed up with the orange jumpsuit crowd, um, which was even better. So it was, it was a good day all around. Um, Republic of the Marshall Islands is really interesting. Um, it doesn't have much surface area. It's just got, you know, like 60 or 70 square miles of actual, you know, dry sand you can stand on. But it's got this huge geographic extent. And Kwajalein is way down at the bottom. Um, here's a picture of Quaj, and uh, as you can see, it's mostly airstrip. It's mostly that runway, which is actually pretty short for an L-1011. So um, we're lucky that Bill Weaver and his crew are really good because it takes a lot to do a gentle landing on that thing because you have 50,000 pounds of high explosives about that far off the ground, and you're trying to do a maximum performance landing on this thing where if you don't make it, you're going swimming. Um, in the same pond where they've been dumping the nuclear warheads for the last 30 years. So, you know, there are lot, there's lots of excitement and entertaining and opportunities for new adventures in, in this thing. Um, oh, one of which was I was amused by this sign, um, which I did not imagine to be a hazard associated with their space, but, you know, in fact, you, you know, you never know. Um, Living on base is cool. Um, they get supplies about every three months on an enormous um, uh, a barge that gets hauled down there from Hawaii. And so there's lots of frozen stuff whose expiration date is a couple months in the past. Okay. And then when, when the C-17 comes in once a week with stuff, they usually bring in some fresh stuff. They'll, um, they'll basically throw on whatever, you know, if there's extra cargo mass, they'll throw on fresh, fresh stuff. But um, you can either eat in the base cafeteria, which is deep-fried stuff, 
Um, or you can eat at this little mini mall where there is a um, there's a Burger King. Oh, and so the rule is when you're at Vandenberg for two months doing integration and tests for your mission to fly out of Kwajalein, don't eat at Burger King because you're going to be eating Burger King for the two weeks while you're <laughs> while you're on Quaj. And then there's Subway, which is not too bad. There's a little uh, Papa John's pizza thing. And then there's a Baskin Robbins ice cream thing, all served by the same person. So, <laughs> so if you want Baskin Robbins and, and, and the guy or the gal is over at the Burger King, you whack on a little bell and they walk around and they put on their different hat. And <laughs> um, lots of commuters from the uh, from the other island over. A lot of the staff functions on island are are filled by a Republic of the Marshallese, Marshallese um, citizens who have jobs there. They typically commute from the uh, from the civilian island, um, and that's a World War II landing craft they use for commuting. Um, housing is pretty nice. It's kind of like living on Mayberry. So um, <laughs> they have a little tiny high school and elementary school and stuff, and everybody knows each other, and the kids just run around and ride their bikes. And um, if you had a family, it would be really great. Um, if you're a single person on the island, um, I talked to this poor uh, cop who was there on a six-month contract. And he had to leave his family at home because he couldn't bring them over for the contract. He was going absolutely insane because there was nothing to do. Um, no cars, it's all golf carts, there are no drunk drivers for the cops to arrest. Um, there are drunk bicycle riders, you know, which provides some excitement. But, um, anyway, so fun place to live. Uh, there's a lot of stuff left over from World War II, fierce fighting during World War II. Um, and uh, there's a Japanese graveyard um, for some un repatriated remains there. Here's a, a short video, I hope, about um, uh, Kwajalein Atoll facility, and this shows a picture of the L-1011 um, coming in, and uh, lots of radars, lots of radomes, um, lots of optical telescopes, um, lots of clouds, but when the clouds aren't in, it's really dark skies. Um, and uh, if you like surfing, if you like scuba diving, uh, there's the L-1011 coming in. So, so um, Bill basically puts this thing down on the first few inches of runway, and then you stand on the brakes, and you get the thrust reversers on as, as, as uh, fast as possible, and you hold on and hope you stop before the end of the runway. Um, but scuba diving, um, it's uh, essentially untouched at all, so it's lovely. I only got a chance to do one dive while I was there because I was so busy. Um, sailing's lovely. Uh, you don't fish in Lagoon because there's lots of heavy metals in the water and unexploded munitions left over from World War II and post-World War II dumping. So the rule is um, if you see something, you don't touch it. Um, there is good fishing out um, in the deep ocean. And there's the Oakland Lab loving out at the hot pads. Once again, they stuck this way at the end of the runway. So if we screwed up, we wouldn't toast anybody else. And if the Pegasus um, lit off, You've got about a minute to get out of the Pegasus if you detect that it's going to be a bad day before it um, what, what was that euphemism? Complete loss of vehicle, I believe, was <laughs> in the briefing manual. Um, yeah, so that's not something I want to experience. So picture in your mind us shivering at, on Vandenberg at 40-something degrees, and now the next day we're on Kwajalein, um, we can't run the APU in the aircraft, so there's no air conditioning in the aircraft. Um, we have the windows tied off, but we are sweating buckets. Um, and we have fans to try and cool the computer equipment because it's starting to shut down because of the heat. Um, and there's the crew. You can see Harry's, um, Harry's back is all uh, wet with sweat. You can see I've got big red Dumbo ears on trying to radiate heat out to the side. It's not working. Um, you can see through the front some of the launch consoles again. Um, Harry orchestrated lifting an enormous aircraft, um, uh, air conditioner up on a forklift through one of the passenger doors. And um, it really didn't do much good and it aged me about five years trying to watch these guys manhandle this puppy off the forklift into the aircraft through this passenger door. Um, it was pretty scary. But everybody was pretty excited, everybody was pumped, we're ready to go, we've got all the thumbs up. Uh, we're looking towards the back of the L-1011 there, so you can see it's all stripped out, uh, no more carpet. Um, those horizontal lines are where you normally cleat down 
uh, the seats for the for the cattle that are sitting back there. Um, and then way in the aft end, you can see the aft um, pressure bulkhead. So it's pretty much a, a bowling alley in there. Um, uh, although you have to be careful on the floor loading, you can't really put any heavy stuff in there. Um, if you if you threw a bowling ball and you and you actually dropped it, you'd probably um, uh, damage that honeycomb floor in, in there. Um, so that's all thumbs up stuff. I told you folks we did a lot of stuff at night. That's the full moon. Um, so I did get to see the full moon. Um, and I got this photo of it up above the L1011. And I did get to see lots of um, actually lovely sunrises. Um, and, uh, you know, by the end of the night, um, the, the cabin got down to uh, 85, 90 degrees. So it was, pretty, it was pretty sweet in there by the end of the night. Um, at the beginning of the night, uh, you know, it would be up almost 95, 98, and the humidity was uh, almost 95, almost 98. So we were drinking, you know, we'd bring in a, a stack of, um, of water bottles and we'd go through those in the night. Um, we had uh, local visitors come in. I don't know if you can see our little crabby there. Who, um, but the land crabs were very interested in finding out if we had presents for them, which we didn't. And getting ready for launch is pretty exciting. Um, uh, we actually get out there about 7 o'clock in the evening to start powering up the observatory to do our functional tests and get it configured and stuff. Because uh, we have to get up that all done before they can start turning on the Pegasus to get ready for launch. And then we have to get all of our stuff packed up and out of there before they can do the engine start um, to get ready to, to actually fly the aircraft. And uh, one of the last things you do on the observatory is you um, put in a bunch of arming plugs. Um, there are a bunch of activities that are safe, things like um, it would be embarrassing to deploy the solar rays inside of that shroud um, <laughs> because it would be embarrassing to have those things fly open in there. Um, there's other embarrassing stuff like if you turn on the radio transmitters, you can actually set off explosives and you can irradiate people. So we have a bunch of these enable plugs that you have in for, for ground testing so that things are safe and you can't screw up. But if you don't put in arming plugs before flight, you're going to have a bad day when you discover that on orbit. So the very last thing you do is you put all those arming plugs in um, and you take some pictures to prove that you did it, and Chris is all smiling because he thinks he was a clever boy and he did it right. Um, you take that picture and then you email it um, back to CONUS, to, to the JPL folks, and they look at it and they say, oh yeah, those all look fine, so you can, you can button this puppy up and you can epoxy it closed and get ready for launch. Well, we were tired and, and we were in a mood, so we decided we would, we would play a little game. So this was the photo of <laughs> the that was sent to the JPL guys. And I thought, you know, it had, you know, the radio transmitter was enabled, and, you know, and the solar panels were enabled, and then five minutes later we sent the photo. And I never heard back from the JPL systems engineer. They did not say one word about, about this photo. And I think Jason was holding on too tight. I, didn't think, I don't think he thought it was very funny. Um, so there's me in front of the Pegasus before, um, uh, before heading over to the mission control facility where we, uh, we were monitoring the flight and the launch. Um, there's a generic picture of a, uh, of a Pegasus tape uh, being uh, uh, lofted on the, uh, on the L-1011. Notice there's not a lot of clearance there. Um, if you lose a couple landing gear um, on takeoff or landing, when you land, you're going to be scraping that Pegasus. And um, friction and heat are good or bad for solid fuel rockets that have fuel. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not a good day. So um, uh, the crew can abandon, you know, if that happened on takeoff, um, they would probably dump the Pegasus in the ocean. Um, just, just dump it. Um, if that happens on landing, the crew has to try and get out of there in about a minute before this thing cooks off. New Star launched at night um, because we wanted to, um, to fly so that when the Pegasus got on orbit and it released the spacecraft, we would just be coming into orbital day so that we would have the maximum amount of time to charge the batteries uh, before going into night again. And so that meant that we needed to launch at about 4 o'clock in the morning um, uh, local time. And so um, we did not have a chase aircraft to take pretty pictures of the Pegasus um, dropping. What we have are these five photos of the Pegasus dropping. These are uh, belly cameras that are on the belly of the L-1011. 
that they typically use for watching the thing during ferry flight, like is it is it burning? <laughs> Do we need to escape? Um, but in this case, these were the the imagery that we got for launch, and then the um, the uh, the sixth frame after that is completely white because of the uh, the light from the exhaust of the uh, of the Pegasus. Um, that's the L1011 coming, uh, taking off, heading back um, uh, to CONUS after a successful mission. So here's the observatory. The solar array has deployed. It gets launched, um, wrapped around this thing. And then um, we spend about a week on orbit, making sure that everything is working. And then we, um, there were some uh, electrically operated uh, restraints that were tying those mirrors to the optics bench so the thing wouldn't move during ferry flight or during launch. And then we're running the electric motor here that takes 20 or 25 minutes um, to unfold all this stuff and get it all to lock together um, precise enough that at the end of 30 feet, it's good to, to a millimeter or so, if I remember correctly. Just phenomenal accuracy, and it just, and it just worked. Um, amazing. Uh, one of the first things we looked at was Cygnus X1, which is a, uh, a typical um, X-ray um, uh, standard candle, although it turns out that um, it is variable. Um, it's not, you know, completely a, a, a standard candle, so, you know, welcome to science and things are just exciting and never the way you like. Uh, here's another uh, comparison. The top uh, right uh, image is what we could do before, and then the bottom uh, thing is uh, showing how wonderful and exciting New Star is. And, why it was so worth your tax dollars. Um, uh, an x-ray image of the galactic center, and you can see we, uh, New Star actually caught a flare of something getting sucked into that black hole at the center of the galaxy. And if you go to, um, uh, probably most of you get Sky and Telescope magazine, or you can go and you can sign up for free to get most of the content of skytelescope.com. Uh, go there and do a, a search on New Star, and you'll come up with a couple of articles about the science results. Um, there was this uh, really interesting thing recently that Alex mentioned, uh, the, the Nature paper, about New Star proving that um, uh, uh, one of the Einsteinian predictions about New Star is, is that all the material is getting um, rotated at almost the speed of light as it's getting sucked into this black hole. Um, so you can read up a little bit more on the details of that. Um, and then there's also this thing, um, that article on the right talks about uh, the Caspian A supernova remnant and New Star is doing some, uh, some interesting, exciting science there. They'll go into details on that, and if you also go to the, um, the Caltech webpage. Um, I mentioned, uh, uh, so New Star's birthday is next week. I'm transitioning off onto other projects. I'm going to be the lead uh, software engineer for the, uh, this ICON mission that's going to look at a low inclination um, aurora that were discovered, as a matter of fact, serendipitously by an Apollo astronaut who was taking pictures of the Earth. And, um, and we saw in those photos that there were not only high and, high and low altitude uh, uh, um, aurora, but that there were also some occurring um, close to the equator. And nobody had predicted that. And we don't really understand what's going on with that. Um, and then the other mission is the Solar Pro Plus mission. Um, uh, Berkeley's got a couple instruments on that, and uh, I'm helping out with the flight software for the Smithsonian Astrophysics payload, um, which is a uh, uh, when we fly down about nine solar radii from the sun, so actually down through the corona, um, the Smithsonian instrument is looking out around the edge of the four-inch thick heat shield, because things get to a couple thousand degrees C when you're there. Smithsonian's building a little experiment that's peeking around the edge of that heat shield, actually looking directly down at the sun. That's going to launch in 2018. The mission goes to 2028 with the closest encounters. We have to do a couple of Venus flybys to adjust the orbit, because once again, we've, we've put the most spacecraft into the cheapest rocket that we could possibly buy. Um, and so we're having to do a couple of Venus flybys to try and get down uh, where we can get within this 10 solar radii which is the magic number for doing the, the in situ measurements that the, uh, that the solar physicists want. This is showing the, uh, the orbit of Solar Pro Plus and uh, the Solar Orbiter, which is a European mission um, that's, that uh, we're going to be collaborating with to do some, some cool measurements. You can sit here until 2028 watching that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thanks very much. <laughs>